Hi guys and welcome to another GA aircraft tutorial here in MSFS. Today we are going to cover the Cessna 414 AW Ram 4 conversion <laughs> aircraft by Flight Simulator. And it is a twin engine aircraft as you can see with two 310 horsepower turbocharged engines, piston engines. And the original design is quite old by now, I think it's from the end of 60s or the 70s. But still Flight Simulator did an amazing job to recreate this aircraft here for the sim. And as usual we are going to perform the full cold and dark startup and also deal with the premium GTN 750 unit by PMS 50. Also this aircraft features some quite unique additional instruments, electronic instruments that we are going to cover. Especially the fuel computer is quite uh, special and takes a bit of time to get used to it. So during this trip we are going to fly from San Sebastian airport in the northern part of Spain which is Lima Echo Sierra Oscar. And we are going to fly eastwards to the airport that serves Andorra. And the identifier is Lima Echo Sierra Uniform. And the airport is called uh, Aeroport Andorra La Seu d'Urgel. I think that's pronounced French in the French way, but who knows. I can already tell you that this will be quite a scenic trip over the Pyrenees between Spain and uh, France. And now let us start the video with some uh, close-up shots of this beautiful external model of the aircraft because it's really very nicely done here in the sim. Looks amazing. It's one of the best GA planes that you can get for the sim right now. Maybe not the best, but one of the best. As you can see at the moment the passenger door is open and also all the tie downs and wicks and covers and everything is still attached to the aircraft that we are going to remove shortly. And now after admiring some of the beauties of the external model, let's hop into the cockpit. So this is the cockpit of the Cessna 414 or 414. Okay, let us start by letting some more fresh air in. We are going to open this uh, right side window right here. That is also all modeled. We have the control lock installed for now. We are going to remove that shortly. So next up, let's have a quick glance over the, over the panels, the instruments that you get and the uh, switches. So for the pilot right there on the left you can see the outside air temperature gauge. This is the Deftron clock that we are going to cover in a separate portion. The airspeed indicator, the ADI and HSI are analog instruments right here. We have an altitude selector where we punch in our autopilot altitude. This is our main altimeter, vertical speed and radio altitude gauge also with the decision height marker. Down there we have the uh, enunciator panel. This is uh, an electric DME instrument for the VORs. Down here we have the cabin pressurization and also the cabin altitude selector wheel. This is the suction gauge, the oxygen quantity. We can pressurize and depressurize the cabin and more controls for the mainly for the uh, pressurization right there. There are some switches for the air conditioning. Our landing gear lever of course, because this one, this aircraft has a retractable landing gear. These are the lighting switches for the internal cockpit lighting. These are all kind of slider switches as you can see and we have the main switch to turn that all on. We have our throttle quadrant with usual throttle, propeller and mixture levers. Right there we have the flaps gauge or the flaps uh, indicator and the flap selector. Right here we have the cabin air pull-out knobs to let air into the aircraft and also the temperature selectors. Right here we have some engine instrumentation. We have the manifold pressure and the RPMs. This is the uh, Hoskins fuel computer that we are going to cover in a second. EGT gauges and the oil pressure and cylinder head temp and oil temp. This is the fuel quantity gauge, a prop D ice gauge that needs to be in the green when the prop de-icing is enabled. The circuit breakers in this aircraft are working for the most part as far as I know. So most of them should be connected to the fitting electrical system. Also down here on the left side we have more circuit breakers. And we have switches for the cabin fan, cabin heater as well. And the avionics bus, the main avionic, avionics switch. All these green switches are for the anti and de-icing. Right here we have the light switches. The anti-collision light in this aircraft is more like a strobe, nav light, taxi light and a retractable landing light. 
And north of that we have the main battery switch, we have the alternator switches for the both engines. Right here we have a gauge to check our battery voltage and our battery drain and the alternators if they work correctly. We have the fuel pumps, we have the engine primer and the starter switches, and the engine magnetos, so two magnetos per engine. And also the parking brake is down here. Once again we are equipped with the premium version of the PMS50 GTN 750 units, the touchscreen GTN units. We have a more modern autopilot installed and we have the transponder unit. Down here we have the uh, fuel tank selectors and right away we are going to select the left main and the right main tanks right here. So that's the normal configuration. Alright, let me show you the EFB tablet a bit more. When you click the time up there you can switch between local and UTC time. You can adjust the brightness of the display. You can toggle or mute the sound, the clicking sound. Once again right here you have the static equipment. Down there you have the maintenance features that are only visual for now. So I'm going to close the engine doors again. And also let's remove all the static equipment. Also down here you can toggle on the GPU. There are some aircraft states that you can load. You can toggle the yoke lock and the rudder lock down here. The rudder lock is only visible from the outside, back at the tail fin of the aircraft. Also here on the, in the cockpit is a click spot to engage the yoke lock. In the upper right you can see all the doors that are currently also opened. And now let us load the aircraft for the flight. So as you can see on the fuel page down here, we can verify that we have the fuel on board that we need. 717 pounds or 120 gallons. With these sliders you can actually fill the tanks, so you don't need the default weight and balance tool by MSFS. Also you get an approximate range with the currently loaded fuel and a center of gravity as well. Also down here visually represented. Now let's go to the loading section. As you can see we have three people on board today. And there are several choices per seat. So every seat has uh, two or three animated models that can sit right there and also the corresponding baggage or luggage weight that can be toggled. As you can see the yellow fields will go to the nose locker, the blue fields will go to the, to the avionics bay, the purple ones are for the wing lockers and also a cargo box can be loaded. I'm going to show you that right quick. This is the cargo box that you can also load. Alright, now we have our 690 pounds of payload loaded exactly. The total weight is a bit higher than what Simreef suggested, but these are profile errors, I think, with the Simreef profile, I don't know. But we are still way below the max takeoff weight, so that's nice. Also, the luggage that you select on the weight and balance page that gets also visually loaded into the aircraft, so now we have the uh, bags right here. Alright, let's have a little look at the passenger models that you get. They look okay, not animated, but also not looking cringy or anything. They are quite okay. Now let me show you the special seat uh, configuration. When you load somebody into seat number 7, you can see that this seat is moving forward, blocking the passenger door pretty much. And now we have someone sitting in the back as well. But usually operators or owners of the aircraft don't place the seat in that position so that the main entrance is free. That's what we are going to do as well. Okay, let me close the nose doors and wing lockers. But let us close the main entry manually so I can show you how that is working as well. There are also some checklists coming with the aircraft and an, and an animated walk around feature. But that is not what I'm going to cover now for this tutorial, that would take way too long. Let's have a quick look at some of the checklists, how they look like. So this is what you get. I'm going to use an external checklist on my tablet, on my own tablet today, so we are not going to use these checklists right here. Okay, let me show you how to close the door. First you use this click spot to raise the lower portion. That also gets locked. And then you are clicking right there to close the upper portion. And then also this handle needs to be flicked down and that's now locked and secured. 
One last thing I wanted to mention before we power up the aircraft is the uh, maximum service ceiling of the aircraft or the cruise altitude. As you can see, we are going to cruise at flight level 190 today and that works totally fine with the aircraft. So I would also recommend a cruise flight level around 20,000 feet. So the lower 20s, that's all fine. The aircraft has a theoretical service ceiling of uh, nearly 31,000 feet. But that is practically pretty much impossible here with the, in the sim. As you can see, the cabin altitude selector goes up to 29,000 maybe. Only 28 is still marked. I did a test flight yesterday at 28,000 feet and there were some issues. The pressurization system wasn't able to cope with the altitude, so we got a cabin altitude warning on the enunciator panel. And also it was too cold at that altitude. With negative 50 degrees Celsius, the heating of the aircraft wasn't able to heat the cabin, so it was freezing cold in the aircraft with below 10 degrees Celsius, I think. So I wouldn't recommend cruising at these altitudes, maybe around 20,000 feet, as I said, that's fine. Also, let us now set this uh, cabin altitude selector at our cruise altitude plus 500, so 19,500 feet. Also, you are supposed to be able to move this outer portion of the selector right here for the landing altitude. But that doesn't seem to work here in the sim. I'm not entirely sure how that is working. Maybe you know it. Let me know in the comments. All right, before we now start with the real power up and get into our flight right here, let me insert a quick extra portion where I'm going to explain to you the Deftron clock and also this Hoskins fuel computer because they work in a quite special way and that takes a little bit of extra explanation. All right, let us start with this device right here. This is the so-called Deftron clock, as you can see. And this one has three main functions. It shows the local time or the GMT time, but you have to set that yourself then. It has a flight timer and an elapsed timer. So this is this switch right here. Let's start with the local time. We are situated in Los Angeles or near Los Angeles at the moment. And the local time is 1.30 p.m. I think, 1.33. So as you can see, the clock is totally wrong at the moment. It has the 24 hour time format and also the rest is wrong. So let's correct that. First of all, we need to go into 12 hour time. So we have to turn off the battery. Then we are switching this switch to the right position for a second. And then we turn the battery back on and now it's in 12 hour time format. Now we have to set the clock correctly and this can be done once again via the left switch and the right switch. First of all we set the hours so we are aiming at 1 right here so with the 1 hour up to the right that sets the hours and when you flick the left switch to the right, that only resets the seconds right here. Nothing else. And we have to use the left position where it says up. That sets the minutes. So now the clock is correctly set. 1.34. And the right switch also has a bright function right here. So you can dim this instrument. It has a bright and a dim function, as you can see. Additionally, there's a flight timer, the middle position right here that starts automatically after liftoff, and an elapsed timer that has this switch for controlling it, so it has a run position. Here you have the seconds, once again the minutes and the hours, and you have the stop command that will halt it and you can continue with the timer and the upper position resets the timer. That's it, that's the Deftron clock explained. And next up we are covering the a bit more complicated uh, Hoskins fuel computer. All right, this right here is the Hoskins fuel computer in its status after flicking on the battery. So now it is in the so-called pre-flight mode and this one has three main functions that you can toggle with this button, the functions button. So right now we are in the gallons remaining mode that shows the gallons that are still in the tanks. First of all, this unit is not connected to the 
fuel tanks so it doesn't know by itself how much fuel is loaded. When we take a look at our fuel quantity gauges we can see we are approximately at a bit more than 25 gallons in each tank. So we are so it's correctly set at 52.3. But it only knows this value because it has been set correctly before. When the plane was refueled at some point and it, the, the instrument was correctly set. But when you refuel the plane now, the instrument won't change. And that's what the fill up function is for and also the add gallons function. So let us start with the fill up function. The maximum amount of fuel that fits into the aircraft are 206 gallons. So let's assume the aircraft got completely refilled. Then we say fill up and hit enter right here. Bams, and that's it. Now we are in the so-called in-flight mode, but we are going to take a look at that a bit later. But now let's assume that we made a mistake and we didn't fill up completely, so we have to reset this unit. How can we do that? We are going to turn off the battery and then we are hitting the test button right there. And now we turn the battery back on and now the instrument is reset to zero gallons as you can see. By the way the test button also gives you this test pattern right here, that's the normal function of it. So that's that. And now let's actually refuel the aircraft and enter the correct value. Now well, first let me let me re-enter the amount of fuel that is currently loaded. So let's go to the add gallons function right here. So we want to enter 52 right here. And with the set button down here you can set the decimals from 0 to 9, as you can see. So 0, then you hit function, that gives you the second decimal. We set 5, and for the third one we say 2. And we hit function again, and now it says verify, and we hit enter. So now we have our previously loaded fuel, pretty much, except the point 3 that cannot be entered, I think. Also down here on the fuel page, you can see that we have 52 gallons loaded. And that's 314 pounds, so we can check that as well. By hitting the function key in the flight or in-flight mode of this unit, we can also toggle two pounds remaining, and that's 312. And right there, 314, okay, comes close. We also have the time remaining when flying, because this unit does know the fuel flow. It doesn't know the amount of fuel that is on board until you set it correctly by yourself. But it knows the fuel flow that flows through the fuel lanes, so it can give you a time remaining value until the tanks are empty. It also has the gallons and pounds used values, so when you fly, fuel gets burned and it knows how much fuel got burned in gallons and pounds. And it also has a timer function that starts as soon as the battery is turned on, I think. That can also be reset down here. You can also reset the gallons and pounds used values down here. Alright, now let's actually fuel the aircraft finally. Alright, now the battery is off. As you can see the battery switch is off. The instrument is off as well. And now we are going to refuel the aircraft. Let's say we fill the aircraft up to 120 gallons. So as you can see, 60 gallons in each tank. That makes also 717 pounds of fuel. Okay, we have 120 gallons on board. Now let's turn on the battery. Now you can see that on the fuel quantity gauge, it says 60 gallons of uh, fuel in each tank. That is correct, we have 120 gallons on board in total. But the fuel computer now says 52 when powering the uh, aircraft up because it doesn't know how much fuel is actually loaded. So now we are going to hit the function button to actually go into the add gallons mode. And now we need to do a bit of math because we have to subtract the uh, 52 gallons of the fuel computer from the 120 gallons that we have now actually loaded. So we have to take the uh, difference between the two and that's 68 gallons 
So the first digit will be a 0, and now the second one will be a 6, and the third one will be an 8. So 68 gallons on top of the 52. And now we say verify and enter. And we have the 120 gallons now set in the fuel computer. So this covers this little snippet with the Devtron clock and the fuel computer. I hope you learned something from it. And now we're going to return to the normal tutorial. And we are back here in the normal tutorial. Now you can see the aircraft from the outside. All the doors are closed, static elements are removed. And now we are going to power the bird up, finally. So let us first flick on the battery. By now you know where it is located here on the panel. We check that we have sufficient volts for engine start, I think 24 volts. And with the bed selector you can see that the battery is discharging right now. You can see that we have close to 20 degrees outside, I think. And we are going to test the enunciator panel and warnings. The clock is set, marker beacon test performed, and also we can test this decision height or radio altitude in instrument right here. Once again, this is the main switch for all the internal lighting that I'm going to show you right quick. Setting the temperatures a bit lower now. Okay, props are already fully forward, also the mixtures get set fully forward. Cowl flaps open, that means pushed in, that will open the cowl flaps. And also we are going to prepare the trim already, right there, this is the pitch trim. Roll trim and nose trim, that seems uh, to be neutral. Left and right main tanks are selected, and this um, emergency crossfeed valve that is in the down position, which is correct. Gear handle is down, and three greens are illuminating. Cabin altitude is set for our cruise altitude. We are in the pressurized mode. We are going to test the flaps. So the flaps of the Cessna 414 are electrically driven. They don't need hydraulic pressure. So they are draining the battery, but that's all. You can see them extended right now. And down here below the engines, you can see the cowl flaps that are now currently fully opened. As you can see, we already get a low volt warning right there, so the battery is dying pretty much. We are going to quickly start the engines. That means we are going to turn on all the magneto switches and also the nef light. Once again, the anti collision light in this aircraft is more like a strobe light, so we are leaving that off. We're going to open the left throttle a bit because we're going to start the left engine first. Let's prime it for some seconds and then hold the starter button. And the left engine will fire up. And it's running. We are aiming at around 8 to 900 RPMs for the initial warm up. And we have oil pressure. And now we are going to lean the engine so that the spark plugs don't foul. I think that isn't simulated yet. There's no maintenance with the aircraft, but maybe at some point. Okay, now we are at approximately close to 900 RPMs, maybe 850, that is fine, we have fuel flow. And we are going to turn on the left alternator. As you can see at the moment the battery is still discharging. Now we are going to turn the alternator on and now the battery isn't discharging anymore and we have also a load on the left alternator. Now starting the right engine, throttle cracked, a bit of priming and we are going to hit the starter button. Right engine fired up. Let's keep it alive. Alright, we have oil pressure, as we can see right there, in the green bench. And now let's lean the engine for ground ops. Also, the right side window is open, so the right engine sounds a bit louder here in the cockpit. Let's also simulate it. 
Let's close the window. And also turning on the right alternator now, we can see it's working. Very nice. Now let's switch on our avionics bus, so the GTN units and all the other avionics get powered. Also turning on the transponder and switching off the ADF unit, because we won't need that today. Now let's engage some air conditioning right here, the cool position that is real air conditioning, and it will cool the air, but we are going to use the circulate function that will give us just a ventilation fan pretty much. Also the cabin fan switch has two positions, the upper position is high and the lower position is low mode, and there's also a cabin heat switch when it's getting colder outside, we may use that to heat up the cabin. Let's pull out some of these cabin air knobs to actually supply the uh, compartments with some fresh air. And we are going to raise the flaps again. Also the takeoff with this plane will be performed with flaps up. That is stand-up procedure right here. By the way, also the sun blinds are working right here and can be turned and rotated in every direction pretty much. A bit fiddly maybe, but you get used to that as well. And up here on the overhead, or in the ceiling, so to speak, there are some more floodlight switches, just as a little side note. Okay, now let us deal with the PMS-50 GTN units. We are going to punch in our flight plan and all that stuff. So going to the flight plan page, you can see our departure Lima Echo Sierra Oscar. Let's import our flight plan from Simbrief to Lima Echo Sierra Uniform. I can already promise you that will be quite a heck of a an arrival right there into this airport surrounded by mountains. Also this time I'm going to remember to set up our cruise altitude here. And also I'm going to prepare the approach, the RNF runway 3, via vectors. That's how it's looking like. And it's all punched in already. Flight plan is prepared. Also let's check out some airport information for our departure. We are at 9 feet elevation only. Beautiful lo location right here of the San Sebastian airport. We have one runway, 5,700 feet length. And let's also already prepare the ground frequency. Of course we also need our weather data. This airport doesn't feature an ATIS or AWOS or anything. In the MSFS options I have currently set the weight units and everything to the US system, because that's what this aircraft is mainly built around. That's also why the altimeters have uh, inches mercury right here, instead of HBA. And now both altimeters should be correctly set. So we have a southwestern wind at uh, 8 knots approximately for departure, that's fine. Let's have a look at the departure charts. Right there you can see the airport diagram. And our departure runway heading will be 219. So that's what we are going to set up now. First of all, let's check that the instrument is correctly aligned with the compass readout. So it's 315 approximately. That's also what the HSI is set to. So we can live with that. Now let's set up 219 for the heading marker. And also I'm going to set the course marker to that value for initial climb. And we're going to hit the CDI button that gives us the GPS navigation source. And then we can follow our GPS flight plan. Also this DME instrument came to life. That gives us some useful information. Also the aircraft ground speed, I think. So we're going to tune in some near VOR. The Sierra Sierra November VR that can also be very useful for our departure. We are going to have a look at the departure chart. It will be the Biarritz 2 Alpha departure that we are flying. Right there we can first see our transition altitude which is uh, 6000. So we are going to lift off and then fly heading 228. Until we intercept the 242 radial of San Sebastian VR. And then also we are going to fly this DME-8 arc 
around the VOR. So that's also why this uh, VOR tuning makes some sense right here. Alright, now let us use FSHUT ATC to request our IFR clearance to Lima Echo Sierra Uniform. San Sebastian Ground, Hotel Bravo Lima Yankee Yankee, Parking Niner, request clearance to LSA Udurjo with information Kilo. Hotel Bravo Lima Yankee Yankee, cleared to LSA Udurjo by Bravo Tango Zulu 2 Alpha, departure runway 22, initial climb 5900, then is filed, squawk 0353. Cleared to LSA Udurjo via Bravo Tango Zulu 2 Alpha departure runway 22 initial climb 5900 then is filed score. Okay, as you can see, I dialed in our initial climb altitude into this altitude selector, and also our altimeter is now set. Squawking altitude already, and now we are going to push the go around button right there on the throttle handle, that gives us the initial take off flight director modes. And also the altitude is pre-selected, there's no need to arm it manually right here in this aircraft. So that is all fine. As you can see also the DME readout is working for our VOR1 that we have set. And via these buttons you can toggle to VOR2 as well. Alright, I think we are nearly ready to taxi now for this very interesting flight in the Pyrenees. Let's do a quick flight control check as well. Everything is free and working. Okay, now let's try to taxi out of here, because the space is quite uh, limited. And also the entry to this GA apron on this airport is very interesting, we'll see that in a second. So let us move, turning on the taxi light down there. That turns on the light at the nose gear strut. And now we have to hardly turn right. As you can see to the left we have an airliner parking and uh, we cannot exit to that direction. So we have to use this tiny taxiway to get to the runway. I think that's how it should work in real life, but I'm not entirely sure. Alright, let us do our run-up checks. So we are now aiming at 1500 RPM. And we are going to do the feather test first. So now we are going to feather the left engine, or the left propeller. That's fine, and now the right side. Towards 1200 RPM, and then back up again. Okay. Also, as you can see, we don't have any further warnings on the enunciator panel, so everything is good. Now for the Magneto test, I'm aiming at 1800 RPM. And now we can do the Magnetos. We have a little RPM drop for every tested magneto right here, that's how it should be. Now let me show you another cool feature of the aircraft, and these are the landing lights. As you can see, they are retracted into the wing, and as soon as you turn them on, they already turn on, but they also extend out of the wing in this forward motion. And that's especially cool when it's uh, dark, because then you can see these light cones really moving forward. That's quite nice. And I think we have an LED upgrade kit right here for the aircraft lights, because they are super bright. Alright, now let us also prepare tower frequency. The problem with FSHUD ATC is that we can now not contact tower from ourselves. We have to be at a specific position on the, air, on the airport, so that we get our tower handoff automatically then. But still, let's continue right here, all the temperatures are looking fine. Cylinder head temps and oil temps, everything is good. The runway seems to be clear, so I think we are now going to enter it. A 
Let's already prepare the flight timer right there. That will start automatically after liftoff, as you have learned in the Deftron clock tutorial portion. And now let me see that I can go somewhere on the airport that we get our takeoff clearance. Line up runway 22, Hotel Bravo Lima Yankee Yankee. Okay, as you can see, I did now find the spot where we get our tower handoff. So we can then use ATC correctly all the way. Alright, before departure, let us switch off our ventilation and air conditioning, because that might uh, decrease engine power a bit. We're going to switch on the anti collision light, so the strobe lights pretty much in this aircraft. And also the stall and probe heaters get enabled. And now we have to do some back taxiing here on the runway before the, we then can uh, depart. Hotel Bravo Lima Yankee Yankee wind 189 degrees at 12 knots, runway 22 cleared for takeoff. Runway 22 cleared for takeoff, Hotel Bravo Lima Yankee Yankee. Alright, we are now aligned on runway 22 for departure. We are also going to turn on the fuel pumps to the low position, or low mode. By the way, I'm using a GA mod, so a GA aircraft mod from the flightsim.to forums. But sometimes, as it turns out, these GA planes do whatever they want on the airport. So I think I will delete that mod again. Just in case you are wondering why these GA planes are driving right here all over the place. But we are now finally ready for departure, let's go! We are giving nearly full thrust, so close to the red bands for the manifold pressure and the RPM gauge. And at approximately 90 to 100 knots we can rotate and there we are off the ground. Now retracting the gear. And now let me set the heading back to heading 228 that we have to follow right now. We have so beautiful views out of the windows, but I have to concentrate on flying here. That's very unfortunate. <laughs> The initial climb performance is around 1500 to 1900 feet per minute. Depends on the aircraft weight, of course. And now let's bring back the engine power a bit. So within the green band for the manifold pressure. And also props back a bit. And soon we are going to use the exact values for the climb then. Now I'm trying to engage nav mode for the autopilot, so GPS uh, following. Somehow that doesn't work. Hitting the nav button, that should in theory give us the GPS flight plan flo uh, following. Now at approximately 120 knots airspeed, that's what I want for initial climb. So we are going to use indicated airspeed climb at 120 knots. Let's try to engage that instead. Okay, that seems to work. Alright, so you have to engage the vertical navigation first. Now dialing that back to 120 knots. And there we have it. Still flying manually for now. You can also see that the flight timer has started now automatically. 2 minutes and 20 seconds in the flight. I want to look a lot more out of the windows, because it's such a beautiful region here in the northern parts of Spain. Incredible. Alright, now let's try to engage the autopilot. Your damper is also engaged. Trimming it out a bit more before engaging it. We're still a bit too fast. Aiming at 120 knots airspeed, as I said. And then we can finally deal with our uh, our fine-tuning of the props and power setting as well. Now we can also disengage the taxi light. And we have to lean the engines a bit more. 
Okay, now let's deal with our climb setting. We are aiming at 31.5 inches of manifold pressure. So that's now set. And the prop setting is very well already. We are aiming at 2450 RPMs, so short of 2500. And we can engage the propeller synchro phaser, that's how it's called. So for climb and cruise you can use this synchro phaser to uh, sync the prop speeds automatically. As you can see we are now coming up on this uh, DME arc section. And I'm quite interested in uh, how the aircraft will handle that. Also let us now re-engage our air conditioning here, or the ventilation system at least. And for now we are leveling off at 5900 feet, that's our initial climb by ATC. Alright, now the aircraft is turning right to enter this uh, ATDME arc procedure around the Sierra Sierra November VOR. As you can see, the flight timer is working. We have also fuel flow and our remaining gallons of fuel on the fuel computer that is also working. Very nice. At the moment, we are on a very low power setting because we are keeping the L2 for now. And I don't want to get too fast. So now let's see how this DME arc procedure works out with the PMS-50 GTN units. And their LNF capabilities. And this is not looking too shabby, I must say. So once again we are aiming at 8 DME and as you can see, it's perfectly set. Very nice. Nice job PMS-50. Awesome. As you can see, we are already below zero degrees. So even though the climate system, the climate simulation right here is a bit strange. Let's bring up the temperature knobs a bit and we'll see what happens along the way. And now I think we can also finally turn off the landing lights. So you have to retract them actually. So the lower switch position is the retract position. And there you can see the landing light is retracting back into the wing. Quite awesome. Also in this position you can see this uh, strobe light that is actually called anti-collision light in this aircraft. Continue climb flight level 190, Bravo, and we can continue our climb to flight level 190 now. So we are going to use vertical speed for the moment so that the airspeed bleeds off a bit before then re-engaging IAS climb at 120 knots. Bringing back the power to 31.5 inches on manifold pressure. There we are coming up on 120 knots. So now let's re-engage IAS climb. That worked quite nicely. Now we can bring back the landing light switch to the off position. And now we are finally somehow in the green band. Let's see for how long. With these uh, temperature knob settings. But as we gain altitude, that will change for sure once again. This uh, cooler knob right there, that doesn't seem to have any function as far as I know. Right here you can see the pressurization working. And also the pressure differential is rising. So the inner needle is the pressure differential. And the outer needle is the cabin altitude. The suction is also looking fine. All is good. Let's have a little look at the de-icing systems. So the enter and de-icing systems. As you can see there's also a de-ice light. So let us turn on this de-ice light and then engage the surface de-ice. That will inflate the de-icing boots on the leading edge. And that's also actually simulated and vis visible right here as you can see. And now to deflate these boots, you have to go to the reset position.
And now let's have a look at this de-ice light from the outside. There you can see the light. That shines all over this leading edge of the wing. On both sides, of course. Also, we by now passed the transition altitude. I nearly forgot to set the altimeters. 29992 now. Okay. Also, there is prop anti-icing and uh, windshield anti-icing. So the leftmost switch is the windshield anti-icing. When it's below negative 4 degrees Celsius, you are using low mode, so the lower switch position. And when it's negative 12 or less, then you are using high mode, which is the upper switch position. Once again, on the GTN unit, you are getting also this climb marker right there. That shows us where we are going to reach our top of climb point. Also, let us engage the weather radar. Why not? For the second screen. The pressurization system is simulated quite well in the aircraft, at least as far as I can tell. Because, as you can see now, at 6000 feet cabin altitude, the uh, pressurization now disengaged pretty much. It is now at 0 feet per minute. But the pressure differential is now rising instead. So now the cabin altitude will not change anymore until the cabin pressure differential reaches its peak. And then the cabin altitude will keep on rising again. That is quite nice. I think that also eliminates the need for oxygen supply way up until over the 20,000 feet mark. Also for now we are in the green band with the temperature already. That's awesome. So I did set the temperature knob somewhat correctly, it seems. Now at negative 25 degrees Celsius outside air temp, it seems. So as I said, at some point when climbing too high and the temperature is at around negative 50 degrees Celsius, the heating systems of the ventilation right here are not capable anymore of uh, getting any heat into the cabin. Another very cool function of these touchscreen GTN units is that you can scroll around the map and click any waypoint you like. Then you can go direct to that selected po uh, point on the map, or you can also directly tune in VOR frequencies, get all the waypoint information with one click. That's quite awesome. And now we nearly reached our top of climb, so our cruise flight level 190, 1000 feet to go. This ALT alert light will light up. And there we are, altitude captured. Now we have to dial in our cruise power settings. So the usual power settings for cruise that also Simbrief suggests are 31 inches for the manifold pressure and 2300 RPMs for the props. So first let us disengage the prop sync because now I'm going to deal with the prop handles right here. And I have to do it with the mouse because I don't have any hardware throttle quadrant. So the props are approximately set now and the manifold pressure as well. So of course the manifold pressure gets regulated with the throttle handles. Okay, looking good. So we can re-engage our prop sync. Further, we can now close the uh, cowl flaps a bit. And everything else is looking fine. Next up, we can lean the engines. So we can cruise along with the lowest fuel consumption possible. Alright, now to lean the engines, I'm looking for the peak in the EGT. So right there, it pretty much is close to the red line. And now I'm going to lean a tiny bit further, so we are a bit lean of the red line, or lean of the peak point. And now that's pretty much set. So in case you're interested, now we are pretty much maxed out with the temperature knobs in highest and hottest mode that is available. And we barely make it into the comfortable green area right there. Also, as you can see, we are now very close to the maximum pressure differential, but we are still at 6,000 feet cabin altitude, so that's very comfortable to, to travel with, I think. Also, now we are at approximately negative 30 degrees Celsius. 
even though on the tablet it says take 24, I don't know. But still, the plane nearly cannot cope with that low temperature anymore, with the cabin temp I mean. So it shouldn't get much colder outside. Okay, as you can see we are cruising with approximately close to 170 knots airspeed and that equals 220 knots true airspeed. Also on the GTN unit you can see 270, close to 270 knots ground speed because we have quite some tailwinds. Nearly 50 knots of tailwind. Now let us deal with our descent calculations and let's have a look at some charts. The transition altitude will be 8000 feet. We are going to come from the western direction right here and then intercept the SU-17 Sierra waypoint, then flying heading 24 degrees. Also at this waypoint we should be at 7300 feet and then descending further to 7000 feet which will be the intercept altitude. So let's plan our descent. 7300 feet at a vertical speed of 1500 feet per minute and we're aiming at this uh, SU-17S waypoint and that's fine. Descent in 16 minutes, okay. And also on the map we now get the top of descent waypoint just after the two roof waypoint as you can see. We can also prepare our decision height. So the climb gradient is not 3%, I'm sure. So we have to enter 2120 feet. Approximately right there. That should be 2150, I think. So we are going to fly an RNF approach this time with the aircraft. In case you're interested how to properly perform an ILS approach, I might be giving an extra snippet of tutorial at the end of this video, or in an extra video. I will see how it fits with the video length and so on. So it might be that an extra video will be coming. We'll see. So you know this fuel computer by now, right? I just had an idea that we can compare the time remaining that the fuel computer calculated with the time remaining from the GTN unit. As you can see, it's uh, the same. So the endurance value is the same as the uh, time remaining value from the fuel computer. Quite nice. Alright, ATC cleared us down to 7300 feet, so we can now initiate our descent. We are also now close to the calculated top of descent point. So let's start with a 1400 feet per minute descent. Bringing back the throttles a bit and also enriching the mixtures a little bit. Maybe let's try 1500 feet per minute now. And you can also see this blue descent marker again on the GTN. It is now pointing towards the correct waypoint back there. Also for descent we should engage the fuel pumps in the low setting. And we can set up our landing altitude even though once again this dial I think is a bit uh, incomplete. Because you cannot use the outer dial. I think in real life that is used for the landing altitude. So now I think the lowest you can go for landing altitude is 11,000 feet, as it seems, but who knows, I don't know. Also when descending we can now fully close the cowl flaps. Alright, we are coming closer to the airport and we just got some headings by ATC. And we are really descending into the mountains right here, it's quite a crazy airport. If you're looking for, for a challenging airport, I can definitely recommend this one, Lima Echo Sierra Uniform. So let us also engage the terrain radar now for the second GTN unit. 
Okay, we got uh, a heading to intercept this uh, RNF approach. And now I'm setting it up 24 degrees for the GPS course needle, because that will be our final approach heading. Now let's go direct to the next approach waypoint, and we are going to hit NEF mode again for the GPS following. And these are really some amazing sights right here. Okay, we can also now re-engage our landing lights. All the anti-icing is off, except the stall and probe heaters, of course. And now we can descend to 7000 feet for the next waypoint. That will be the intercept waypoint, pretty much. Now let us open the coil flaps again. We need full prop RPMs for approach. And as you can see on the GTN unit, we even have a, a virtual glide path for this RNF approach. That's very awesome. Our needles are synced, so now let us hit the approach button. We get the virtual glide path that the aircraft will then also intercept, like an ILS. Altimeters are correctly set, and soon we are going down towards uh, this very special airport serving Andorra. Now the gear comes down and the first stage of flaps. So that happens at around 150 to 140 knots. And now on the glide path we can then pull out the next stage of flaps. So it's flaps 30 I think it is. So this approach really sends you down this valley with mountains on all sides. Quite awesome. Now the mixtures get set to full rich as well. I think at very high elevation airports it's also wise to lean the mixtures out a little bit so you get full available engine power in case of a go-around. Go so that's also what we are doing now. Mixtures get leaned a little bit, everything else is set. All the lights are on, all the anti-icing is off once again. As you can see, this approach doesn't take us straight down to the runway, but we have to fly this little manual extra turn right here. Autopilot and flight director are off by now as well, of course. Now at approximately 1000 feet above the airport elevation, we are going to pull out full flaps. So 45 degrees, I think it is, of flaps. So now we are fully prepped and set for landing. And the air here is so bumpy with all the mountains all over the place. Such a difficult approach right here. Also we have 15 knots of tailwind. I think this won't work out right here. The plane is just bouncing around in the air like, like a football. <laughs> That will not work. The aircraft will not touch down, so we have to go around. Full power. Now we get the gear horn warning, but that doesn't matter. Also, we are close to a stall, we hardly gain altitude right here. So gear is up and uh, first stage of flaps is set for the go-around. And now we have to watch out to not fly into mountains and then we will try the visual approach runway 21, I think it is. So with these winds we cannot land runway 3. We will try the uh, other runway instead. Alright, we did turn around in the valley. 
behind the airport and now we are approaching the visual for runway 21 I think it is. Let me double check that one right quick. Yes indeed, runway 21. So even when the winds are coming from the correct direction, this is, this is super tricky right here. We get all these wind turbulences from the mountains around the airport, wind shears and downwind drafts and everything. So prepare for a very interesting landing, my friends. Coming in towards the runway with a bit more altitude than usual. And we are down. That was one of the most extreme landings I did so far in the sim, I think. The terrain right here is crazy. And then combined with the real chirp cat areas global add-on that also features the terrain turbulences, it's very challenging. Try it yourself, I can recommend it. <laughs> Alright, after exiting the runway we are going to switch off the landing lights and the strobe lights, so the anti-collision lights they are called. Also stall and probe heaters get disabled. Transponder to on mode. And there we are. Welcome to Andorra, La Seu d'Urgel. That's how it's probably called. Alright, also leaning out the mixtures a bit more for ground ops. Further, we can now switch off the landing lights, so out of the retract mode, and we can raise the flaps. Fuel pumps off. And I think that's pretty much it for taxiing now. So let's look for a free GA spot right here on the ramp. So I think the video isn't that extremely long yet. So we will do the ILS approach tutorial coming up next. So stay tuned also after the uh, shutdown procedures. The video will continue. So I hope you will stay my friends. Now we arrived at our spot, taxi light off, also the nav light can now be shut off, the ventilation systems and heaters, deleting our flight plan, switching off the terrain radars and everything, transponder standby, avionics bus off, alternators off, And also the main ventilation and air conditioning switch off. All these cabin air knobs get uh, pushed in and now we can shut off the engines. So all there is left to do is to switch off all the magneto switches. Also we are going to close the cowl flaps, fuel tanks off, prop levers back, that's optional. But I think the aircraft always spawns with them in the aft position as well. Alright, now we can finally shut off the main battery. And we can open some doors, deboard the aircraft. And that will be it for this uh, tutorial flight. Next up comes once again the ILS approach. Okay my friends, welcome to this uh, quick ILS tutorial with the Cessna 414. Chancellor by FlySimware. For this purpose we are in my home country, Germany, and we are flying towards Dortmund Airport, Echo Delta Lima Whiskey, for the ILS Broad Runway 24. So the first thing you need to do is of course tune in the ILS frequency, which is 111.3. And we 
we will transfer that into the active. So we have the ILS for runway 24 now prepared. And we need the cores. As you can see, the intercept will be at 3000 feet, then flying down to the, to the runway, heading 239er. Decision height is 200 feet. So now we need to set our course uh, marker right here. Two course 239er, that is now set. And now we are approaching the ILS, we are going to select heading mode to fly via heading towards the ILS course. And now we have to hit the CDI button to go into VLOG 1 nav source. So out of GPS nav source and now in localizer 1 nav source. And now we have also all the markers coming up for the ILS. So we have our localizer course and also the glide slope markers that are now alive. Also when you set this OBS, I think it is called, this OBS instrument to the correct course of the runway 239er, then it will additionally show the ILS information. So now we are going to arm the localizer capture via hitting the nav button. You could also use the approach button directly, but before catching the glide slope I would like to descend to 3000 feet manually. So that is what we are going to do next. As usual we are setting all the props and mixtures to full. Lights on as well. And now we are approaching the localizer course. And the aircraft is turning left towards course 239er. I'm also adjusting the heading marker now because we are no longer in heading mode. We can also set the heading marker to runway heading. And we are just reaching 3000 feet. And now I'm aiming at a speed of 150 knots. And now we are also arming the approach mode. So now the glide slope capture is also armed. Cowl flaps opened. There the glide slope marker is coming down on the ADI and also the HSI and the GTN unit and the OBS instrument on the left. So there are four glide slope markers pretty much. Gear down and flaps one. And now we can also already extend flaps 30 degrees. So the second stage of flaps staying around 130 to 120 knots airspeed now. So on the chart you can see airport elevation is 425 feet, so at approximately 1400 feet we are going to extend the final stage of flaps. Which is right now, so full flaps now. And now for final approach we are going to stay around 100 knots of airspeed, so 110 to 100 knots. Autopilot off, flight director off and your damper as well. And now we are just going to land it. So now thought is idle. And this time I absolutely didn't want to float, so we are down already. <laughs> so this is how the ILS approach works in the Cessna 414. And that will conclude this tutorial with the FlySimware Cessna 414AW RAM4 conversion Chancellor, that's how it's called. I hope you enjoyed the trip with this quite amazing GA plane right here in MSFS. As usual it would make me very happy if you consider giving the video a like and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That would be awesome, and I hope to see you next time. So, until then, have a good one, stay healthy, and bye-bye.